Good morning, and welcome to the Sunday morning broadcast of Marvin United Methodist Church's Sanctuary Service. My name is Doug Baker. I'm the senior pastor of the church. And on behalf of the Marvin family, welcome to this time of worship. Let's join in as the sermon is underway. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So glad to have you here. I want to welcome those who are joining us by live stream and also on our Sunday morning broadcast. We're glad that you are joining us in this service of worship. So glad each of you is here this morning. It's a glorious day to be in worship. The anthem choir was outstanding. Thank you so much for that, Jim. Thank you, choir. Every Sunday they bless us, but that was very, very special. We just thank you so much for your offering in worship. And Jim, as you played the organ with wonderful words of life, I felt like I was on a spiritual carousel. Anybody else? Because maybe when we get to heaven, there'll be a spiritual carousel playing the hymns of the church. I don't know, but I look forward to that. I look forward to that very much. Let's pray together. Lord God, thank you so much for this opportunity to be in this beautiful place with these beautiful people to share in your word, these wonderful words of life. Lord, I ask that you might speak through me that what is shared will be helpful to those who gather to worship you May your Holy Spirit be permitted to work in our lives, to make us better, to help us to push back fear, and to live in the fruits of your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I've entitled this sermon, Pushing Back Fear. And if you were to look up pushing back in the dictionary, or if you Googled it and looked for a definition, you would find a negative or unfavorable reaction or response, a pushback. And friends, that's what I really want to encourage each of us in this room to begin to think about. Whenever fear begins to creep into your mind, whenever fear begins to take hold of your heart, whenever fear begins to start forming your decisions or start forming your personality and who you are in Jesus Christ, I want to give you permission to push back. I want to give you permission to push back in faith and to lean into God's goodness and to lean into a trusting relationship with Jesus Christ. Not to rely on your own abilities or your own human tendency to be drawn into a cycle of fear, but instead to step out in faith and to believe that your God is bigger than whatever fear you may be facing this day. I am a work in progress. I will confess to you this day that fear is one of the things that shapes too much of my decisions and too much of my life. And I feel like I want to move in a forward direction on pushing back some of the fear in my life to be more bold in Jesus Christ and to make decisions that will honor and glorify him as I trust in God. Fear is something that God followers have been wrestling with for thousands of years. The very fact that Psalm 27 speaks to those words, whom shall I fear, helps us to acknowledge and recognize that fear is a very real thing and it has been for a very, very long time. In fact, I read in, the, in my study this week that fear not is found 366 times in the Bible. One for every single day of the year, and one for that leap year day, that extra day that we get. I think it's cute because my mother was born on February 29th. She's a leap year baby. She's going to be 22 years of age <laughs> next year. Our grandchildren laughed when she finally turned 21 and she could go have a drink legally. <laughs> Fear not. I would say that a consistent theme throughout Scripture a consistent challenge for everyone who's ever followed God, even those in the Bible stories we read, is wrestling and pushing back the fear that often creeps into our lives. What does David say? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? 
The Lord is the strength or the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? David continues, even when the wicked advance against me to devour me, or though an army besieges me, or war breaks out against me, I will not fear. I will be confident. Why? Because God is bigger than my fear. So David, what kind of things were happening in your world that allows you to write a hymn, a worship song such as this? I mean, you lived in a palace, right? You were the king of Israel. Oh, but let's go back and remember the stories of David, and we will see that he had plenty of opportunity to practice and exercise faith and not to crumble in fear. David, when he was asked by Saul, who will go and fight? Are you sure that you're the one who wants to go and fight this giant named Goliath? David recalls back into his mind to a different time when he was a shepherd boy there and he was watching the sheep and wild animals came, a lion and a bear who came and grabbed one of his lambs and took that lamb away, just kind of like his father. The father's grabbing a child right here. <laughs> David went after that wild animal and struck the animal and killed it. And when the animal uh, tried to fight back, he grabbed it again with its hands and he struck it dead. David says, the Lord rescued me. This is from 1 Samuel 17. The Lord rescued me from these animals and God will rescue me from this giant Philistine just as he was with me then. And as Pastor Melanie read the scripture just a moment ago, when the children of Israel, the great warriors of Israel's army were shaking in their boots, wouldn't even come out of their tents. And we recall that one thing that this giant Goliath did, this nine foot monstrosity of a man, this, this proven warrior, every morning and every night for 40 days would come out to the battle lines calling for one individual to have the courage to come out and fight him. And he would taunt the God of Israel. He would defy the God of Israel and he would continue to barrage them with difficult words and their morale was so low, they just stayed in their tents afraid until David would come. And David would, would say, as Pastor Melanie had read, I come to you in the name of the Lord whom you have defied. As the chief commander of King's army, of King Saul's armies, David would be proven in battle. If you remember from 1 Samuel 18, the women's song who said, Saul has slain his thousand but David has slain his tens of thousands. And when King Saul began to have what maybe we have as a mental disease of paranoia, and he begins to believe that this David, who is he thinks the next king is, is, uh, needs to be taken out by his armies, and David is in pursuit, I mean, excuse me, being pursued for his very life, David must have been thinking as he ran for his life, God, you have been my salvation in the past, and though armies besiege me, and though war is breaking out against me, I will be confident, I will not fear, because the Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? David was battle-tested. These are not metaphors for him. He had plenty of opportunity to be afraid, but he stepped into faith. He exercised his faith, and again, he believed his God was bigger than the fear that encroached in his heart. So let's make a working definition of fear as we begin to unpack this sermon a little bit. Fear is a perceived danger, a threat that causes a metabolic organic change in our lives. When your heart starts racing, when your body temperature changes, when you begin to think kind of crazy thoughts and you begin to maybe panic or you're fleeing or you're hiding or you're freezing, these moments are these responses that our body has when we are feeling threatened and we are stressed. It can move into loss of sleep the weakening of your immune system, and also can, if not cared for or treated or dealt with, can move into depression. 
All this because we fear that something is going to harm us or hurt us emotionally. And friends, fear is something we all deal with. Fear can be also channeled for good, for motivation to change a course or a life and to fight instead of flight. And sometimes we need to fight. I was talking to a friend recently who went to see the doctor and the doctor said what maybe the doctor said to many of us in this room, you need to lose a little weight. But behind that statement came, if you do not lose weight, let me tell you, you are moving towards being diabetic. And so I encourage you to take control of your diet, take control of losing weight so that you will not have to deal with diabetes. And this friend of mine is changing. He is losing weight. He has allowed the fear of diabetes to help him get on a path for health. But friends, there are lots of things that can cause us to fear. I did some examinations of some surveys to find out what Americans fear today. And I look back over the course of many years. And do you know that in the past, Americans feared public speaking? How many of you fear public speaking? Well, there are, that used to be something that oftentimes was at the top of some of these charts. People were afraid of public speaking, but friends, because of the times in which we live, there are other things that are now eclipsing that. That doesn't even make the survey anymore. People are now more concerned about terrorist attacks. People are now more concerned about North Korea getting nuclear weapons. People are now concerned about their government, their politicians, the policies that they're making. People are now concerned about other things that are now eclipsing the fear of public speaking. But there are some that have been consistent as I looked back not having enough money to retire in one's future or money to survive, loss of health or relationships, the death of someone that you love. These are just a few that made the list. But honestly, I think we can all expand on this a little bit. And I'm gonna rely on a a friend, author. He's not a friend, but he's uh, someone I like to read. Does that make him a friend if I read his stuff often? I don't know about that. He's a, he's a friendly author. His name is Chuck Swindoll. Many of you know him. I read a devotion of his about fear, and I want to borrow his words and share them with you because they're beautiful. He calls fear a beast. Have you ever met a beast named fear? Fear creeps into your life through a dozen different doors. The fear of failure, the fear of heights, the fear of disease, the fear of rejection, the fear of unemployment, the fear of what others are saying about you, fear about moving away, fear about death, fear about financial reversal, fear of war, fear of the dark, fear of being alone. Lurking in the shadows around every imaginable corner, it threatens you and it threatens your inner peace and your outward poise. It is a bully. The creature relies on scare tactics and surprise attacks. Fear watches for your vulnerable moment, then picks the lock that safeguards your security. And once inside, it strikes quickly to transform spiritual muscle into mental mush. Wow. Thanks, Chuck. Wow. Said it beautifully. Spiritual, spiritual strength, spiritual muscle becoming mental mush. And I don't know about you, but that kind of resonates with me. So if you're taking notes on your bulletin, I want you to just write down one thing, if you will. What is it? What is it that's giving you fear today? It could be a relationship. It could be what other people are thinking about you. It could be your job. It could be something related to your family or relationships in your family. I don't know what it is, but just jot it down. And I want to remind you that our God is bigger than whatever fear you may write down on paper. In his book, Goliath Must Fall, Louis Giglio states that fear is a giant. And with the help of Jesus Christ, fear must fall. And following the story of David and Goliath from 1 Samuel 17, which Pastor Melanie read. Louis Giglio talks about just as fear uh, taunts us, he taunts us just the same way 
that Goliath taunted the, ch the children of Israel and their armies in the camp. Fear is relentless. Fear doesn't take a day off. Every day, fear shows up to tell you what you did wrong, what you should think about yourself, and begins to fill your mind with negative thoughts and, and worst case scenarios. That's how fear works. Or sometimes fear will surprise you and bring that surprise attack or that tactic that knows your weak spot and fear begins to creep in and take control of your mind. But the story has a surprising turn, doesn't it? When a young shepherd boy with a slingshot says, you can't defy our God, our God is bigger and greater than what you present to us, you giant nine foot Goliath. David believed the battle was the Lord's and the Lord would deliver Goliath into his hands. David had a faith that was bigger than his fear and he refused to be paralyzed like the other soldiers in the camp because of the taunts of the enemy. So don't let fear paralyze you. Don't let fear wear you down. Don't let fear tell you you're not good enough or your, your faith isn't strong enough. That's just the fear tactics at work. Psalm 27, three says, though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. I studied that word heart, looked it up in the Hebrew lexicon and the word is lab. And the word lab means more than just an organ that pumps within your body. The word lab means the inner being of a person, their mind, their will, and their heart. Friends, when we face any kind of danger or fear, we must bring all of our trust in God because friends, what I've discovered is in my heart, I may trust God, but it's this mind that sometimes gets me in trouble. Anybody else wanna to agree to that? You think in your mind, God has delivered me in the past or in my heart, God's delivered me in the past. He's been there in the past for me, but then the mind says, well, what about this time? You're not ready, you can't do it. And you've got to fight that battle. I reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul who said in Romans 12, we come asking God to transform us by the renewing of our minds. And we remember the words of Jesus Christ who said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. That's that all-consuming word, laid, the whole person, not just our heart connected, disconnected from our mind. Well, friends, David goes on to say in confidence, the Lord is my light. And light reveals truth and light dispels darkness and fear. That's the Bible's common narrative. The light brings righteousness. The light brings God's presence. And next Sunday, we're gonna have a very special litany of celebration for these beautiful windows. Because these beautiful windows let God's creative light the sunlight burst into this space and fill our hearts with joy and fill our hearts with warmth as we come to worship the living Christ. We'll hear words next week like, Lord of light, in the beginning you separated light from darkness, you declared that it was good. And when Moses and the children of Israel escaped in the darkness of night, you sent a pillar of flame to light their way. And when we in our sin turned away and called for darkness to surround us, you pursued us. Even darkness is not dark to you. And in the darkness of night, the light of the world, Jesus Christ, was birthed onto our planet, and he is our true light. Every Sunday morning, we gather in this sacred, beautiful space. Last Sunday, I had the opportunity to preach in the contemporary service. And friends, I enjoy preaching in the contemporary service. I enjoy being in that setting. But let me tell you one thing I miss about being in that setting is that there are no windows in the Herd Worship Center. There is no natural light that comes into that space. It is all man-created light. And when those lights come on and they are bright, you cannot see the faces of the people you are preaching and speaking to. And one of the things I love about this room is as I'm speaking to you, I can see your faces. I can see the love of God in your eyes. I can see the warmth of Jesus Christ in your heart as we exchange our glances and as the sermon is proclaimed. Friends, that is a gift and I give thanks for the beautiful stained glass windows and the natural light that fills our space. And I thank you again for preserving it for generations to come. The Lord is my light. And lastly, 
The Lord is my salvation. The name Yahshua is the Hebrew deliverance, rescue. The name Jesus, Yahshua, means the one who saves. Jesus is the one who saves. He is our salvation. And let me just share a personal story. Many of you know that Gina's father passed away last Monday early in the morning in hospice care in Florida. And I, as we, Gina and I got on a plane on Monday afternoon and flew to Florida to be with her mom and her sister and the family that had gathered there, let me tell you, I have a better and a new appreciation and understanding of the salvation of the Lord. Because her father, two months ago, broke his back. And he this is a strong man, a man who, though 83 years of age, still lifted weights regularly, a man who was still taking vitamins, a man who was proud and worked hard to keep his health, a man who was a very successful and accomplished businessman, a man who I deeply love and respect. And this man broke his back, and then infection settled into his body. His blood and his back were compromised by his infection. It began to compromise his mind. And we were on a very difficult path, two months of very difficult uh, uh, struggle to get him to do his rehabilitation and to recover from the fall. It was getting worse, and it was getting worse. And let me tell you, A decision was made last Wednesday a week ago to move him to hospice care. But let me tell you, as I was with the family, I heard a beautiful story writing me. I heard a beautiful story writing me this story. She said, I want to tell you, on Tuesday night before we met with the doctor, I had a dream. And the dream was this, that it was time to let Jim go. It was time to let him go. And the beautiful thing is, Her daughter, Lisa, had a a just similar dream the same night that it was time to let dad go. So when they met with the doctors and made that decision to stop the care, stop the antibiotics, stop the rehabilitation, they were all on the same page. God had prepared them for that moment. Lisa told me as we were talking that when they got Jim settled into his hospice bed, got him shaved, got him cleaned up, got him all set, she said, Daddy, I want you to know we're not going to be treating you anymore. You don't have to do any more rehab. You are here, and we're going to make you comfortable. And his words were, thank you. This man, a very proud man, a man who was someone who was fighting with every broken hip and every ailment that he had had, had given up his fight, had given up the will, and it was frustrating the family to watch this. But let me tell you, salvation came through hospice ministry because it gave him the opportunity to die with dignity. It gave him permission to just rest and be in God's arms and allow him to pass that way. It gave his family the opportunity to give him permission and the space to do what he needed to do and to go and be with God. And friends, that is salvation. Because one of the other meanings of the word yasha means to bring into an open place. And friends, when you are on a pathway and it doesn't seem like you can get back to where you wanted to go or where you wish you could be, and your loved one isn't where you hope that they could be, and you come to that open place where you're allowed God's will to just be done, and you're allowed for the natural things to take their course, it is salvation. Friends, you don't have to be on a deathbed to know that kind of salvation. I know there are people in this room that are fearful because there is something they have done that's being hidden from someone they love, and they, they, they're all torn up, and they're fearful inside. And God says we need to get right with him. We need to confess it. We need to be honest and transparent with each other. And when we can come clean, There can be healing. There can be that openness of forgiveness. There can be salvation. There may be others in this room that have some kind of fear that's keeping them. They're struggling. They're perfectionists. They can't seem to get everybody the way they want them to or or trying to helicopter their children and they can't get them to do what they want them to do. But let me tell you, being in control will drive you crazy. Sometimes coming into salvation means the openness to trust that allow people to make their decisions and to love them through that process. Friends, there are many applications to what may be giving you fear today. My prayer for you is this. When you become afraid, you will remember the Psalm of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. 
whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? If you wrote down something in your bulletin, something that was causing you fear, I want you to put something next to it. I want you to put a less than sign right next to it. And right next to that less than sign, I want you to write God. Because God is greater than whatever is giving you fear today. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching our broadcast this morning. As I wish for you God's blessings, I want to personally invite you to join us for Sunday services and fellowship on our campus at 300 West Irwin Street, downtown Tyler. I hope you'll visit our website to learn more about our church and its ministry and serving opportunities. Thank you again for worshiping with us today.